different. So that bottom one, I've exaggerated, is a little closer than the others. And so when you do the Raman coupling, it's far enough to tune that that third state doesn't matter. Right? So from here on out, we can think of it like a two-level model, pretty simply. So this is what the Hamiltonian ends up looking like. And uh, so you can see that it kind of looks like a lattice. Maybe it has a cosine term in the top there. But the thing to keep in mind is that delta omega, the frequency that the lattice is moving past, is like 7 megahertz. It's fast. It's whipping past super quick. So it's not really appropriate to think of it like a lattice. So instead, what we do is rotate, do a unitary transformation to an addressed basis. And that's the uh, H prime frame there. And you'll notice that when you do that, a term comes out that has linear momentum and the spin matrix multiplied together. That product of momentum and spin is spin orbit coupling, right? It's that, that one term in the Hamiltonian represents how when you do a spin flip, you also pick up momentum, right? And so the uh, spin orbit coupling is usually thought of in the atomic perspective where the angular momentum of the electron couples to the spin. But in this case, it's linear momentum coupling to the spin. So we can look at it just in one dimension, really. Right? Uh, so OK, so how do we build the dispersion for this kind of thing? In the dress basis, we look something like this, where one of the parabolas represents the p squared over 2m, just the kinetic energy of one of the spin states. And then the other one is momentum shifted and is the other spin state. OK, so if there's no coupling at all, those two parabolas just cross, and then we're fine. Great. So Flexibility, this is what we can do, is if we start turning up the Raman coupling, it opens a gap. And you'll also notice that the minima of those two dispersion also move closer to each other. So you have a lot of flexibility on the uh, momentum distribution. You can basically design your dispersion to do lots of interesting things. Uh, and then if we do detuning, we can bias one of the states over the other state. And the color mapping here indicates the spin, uh, the spin composition of that eigenstate on that curve. So you'll have, you have a, an interesting dispersion that also has an interesting spin texture built into it. OK, so uh, one of the interesting things we've done with this is we've uh, started with spin orbit coupling and also added a weak optical lattice. So the optical lattice uh, also transitions atoms in momentum space, but they do not flip spin. So it stays within one of these parabolas. And I'll show you what the coupling looks like. So in this picture, the spin orbit coupling is straight up and down arrows. You can see that if it goes from the blue parabola to the red parabola, you've gone, you've spin flipped from blue to red, and you've also picked up a bunch of momentum. You're higher up on the parabola there, right? So you can see the coupling is in the straight up and down direction. If we add a lattice, it couples to the same parabola, but at different momenta. Right? And so what we've done here, uh, you can also think about the coupling in the dressed picture. So if we incorporate the spin orbit coupling into the picture, re-diagonalize the matrix, you can see that you get this dressed picture where you've included the spin orbit coupling. And then the lattice couples a variety of different places on this, on this dispersion. Now the key character that we want to play with here is that the bottom of the dispersion, you're directly coupling the two prime to the five prime state. So those are two points on the dispersion curve that have different momenta, but are coupled directly together. So if you, in, if you include that coupling, the ground state configuration becomes a superposition of those two things, right? So whenever you have a two level system and you start driving a, a coupling between the two, the ground state will be a mixture of those two things, right? So when you have a mixture of momentum states, you get something that looks like an interference pattern. So this is one way of realizing something that looks like a super solid state. So this is just some brief uh, uh, GP simulations of our, of our experiment, where uh, we have adiabatically created this ground state where we have spin orbit coupling plus an optical lattice. And that results in a density modulation that looks kind of like that while maintaining a superfluid at the same time. So this uh, super solid is something that has both crystalline order and superfluidity at the same time. Now, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of subtleties that go into this, but what I can say is that this system uh, allows for a lot of flexibility because we can use that weak optical lattice that we put in there to preferentially excite crystal modes inside the supersolid rather than doing full like super 
superfluid oscillations, we can just make the crystal move, which is a different kind of thing. It's a different kind of sound mode in the system. And so that way we can explore the excitations of a super solid itself. No. Right, so they are, um, so the, the fringes here are locked into what the optical lattice's periodicity is. So, but because it's such a weak optical lattice, we something use like half an E recoil here, the superfluid is still able to flow over that lattice. So the nature of this system is actually still unknown to us and we're still looking into this. But um, if I, like if I move the detuning of the optical lattice, in principle, I could excite the crystal motion and it would flow over the optical lattice once, some, once the excitation has been created. That's our belief anyway. Right, so a regular optical lattice, in order to get this kind of density modulation, you'd have to crank it way, way up, right? It would have to be a very strong optical lattice. So the atoms would be essentially localized in, within the lattice. That's a fantastic question. It's, it's a crossover as far as I can tell. Yeah. So uh, the, the question then is, is those phonon modes that I'm talking about, those excitations in the crystal, um, how similar are they to a true supersolid where, the, where the, uh, the crystalline structure is intrinsic, right? So we believe that our, we will simulate those phonon modes, but with a gap. So the gap will correspond to the lattice's strength as, that it imposes on the system. Okay. <laughs> okay, so another example of what we've done with spin orbit coupling is also added in a, uh, a direct radio frequency coupling between the two states. So in this case, I couple the spin states directly, but not the momentum. And when we do that, uh, we recover a Hamiltonian, which looks like this. So we have spin orbit coupling, and then I also have an RF coupling on the side. Now, what's interesting about this though, is that we can transform the Hamiltonian by simply moving into a, a moving frame and recover something that looks like an optical lattice. So I want to try to be a little more clear about this. Spin orbit coupling is not an optical lattice. It has no periodicity at a relevant time scale. Time scale. The RF is not an optical lattice. It's just radio frequencies that are blasting through the whole system, right? But when we add the two together, we get a spatially periodic potential that looks that is an optical lattice. So it's like the combination of two things that are not spatially periodic recover something that is spatially periodic. And the power of this is that we can uh, use the detuning of the Raman beams to actually uh, drive block oscillations. So really quickly, this is what the band structures look like. Uh, there's some interesting character here. Uh, you'll notice that the two bottom bands are parallel, which is kind of weird for an optical lattice. Normally they kind of, uh, they come together rather than going <laughs> parallel like that, uh, which uh, allows for a, a lot of interesting uh, physics and dispersion engineering. Um, and also that the, what's not shown here is that there's a lot of interesting spin textures in there as well. Uh, so what we've shown so far is that one can do block oscillations in this, in this lattice structure. This is an example of our observational data uh, where we've just uh, ramped the Raman detuning and that has generated block oscillations through many Brillouin zones, which is, uh, is, is very weird for spin orbit coupling, right? Um, this is preliminary data, so each of these are just one shot, so it's a little bit noisy, but you can see clearly that there's a, uh, uh, an oscillation character around the lattice velocity. So uh, this plot over here, we have on the y-axis, effectively the momentum of the atoms, the average momentum of the atoms, and on the x-axis is the lattice velocity. And so that kind of wave around the mean is uh, block oscillations. Okay. I realized I think I went a lot faster than I meant to, but this is our group and collaborators. So this work we've, we've done in collaboration with Chen-Wai Zhang at UT Dallas and uh, Yongping Zhang, not, re not related, uh, at the University of Shanghai. Uh, we have, I just wanted to highlight these two collaborators because they were involved in this work. Uh, but we, uh, yeah, thank you. That's all. Questions, so who has questions? Spin orbit coupling, Raman coupling on and a lattice. So we had spin orbit coupling, the, Ra the Raman coupling, and an optical lattice, lattice, yes. The Raman coupling strength. 
what was the Raman coupling strength? Yeah, so um, in order to make this work, we used a 1064 nanometer lattice, but our Raman beams are 789, right? So they have very different wave vectors. So what's interesting about this is we turned up the Raman coupling to 2.70 recoil. And that number was important because it brought the two minima of the dispersion to closer together, and that matched the wave vector of the lattice itself. So we used a spin orbit coupling of 2.70 recoil and a lattice of some anywhere between half an E recoil and one E recoil. So when you say supersonic, you mean the kind of the periodicity is the periodicity of your density is the same as your lattice. Yes. So it doesn't really spawn kind of a it's, it's certainly not spontaneous, absolutely. So we say it's super solid-like in that we're doing a quantum simulation of a super solid, one could say. So because we're using such a weak crystal uh, we, such a weak optical lattice, we expect much of the superfluid characters to, to remain. And we are really interested in seeing how much of the excitation spectrum is the same as a true super solid. But it's certainly not spontaneously creating the crystals. One benefit here is that you'll notice when you saw the picture of my density distribution that I have uh, hundreds of, uh, or maybe, well, maybe tens, I guess, tens of densities, uh, density peaks, as opposed to the dipolar gas community where they have like three, maybe, right? So we would be much closer to a bulk crystal condition. So if we can make that optical lattice weak enough and still maintain the density modulation character of it, we could simulate something that looks like a super solid state. We're getting to it. We're trying. That's the next step. Just, just a comment on this one. This is a, perhaps has something to do with the terminology. Mm -hmm. That, okay, so we talk about super solid in two popular contexts. One is the free space. Mm -hmm. Then it's very clear super solid is very different from super fluid. And there has to be a phase transition mm -hmm. between these two, just following Landau's argument. Mm -hmm. If you apply this idea to a optical lattice situation where you have underlying external potential, mm -hmm. then I would say the if the super solid, the state itself doesn't break the the underlying crystal mm -hmm. structure, then yeah. then it would be the same phase as the just normal. Right. Superfluid. So if it's and a perfectly so, rigid crystal, for yeah, example, I, I will like I will think about the, a super solid in the presence of optical lattice as. A, it's a system where you have the superfluid and then the density modulation periodicity actually differs from the optical lattice. That corresponding to in the free space break the underlying sure. translation. I think, I think the, more, the more important distinction is if the excitations of the crystal lattice can coexist with the underlying. So if, if, it's, if it's perfectly rigid and locked into the optical lattice's periodicity, then I completely agree. That's not a super solid. It's not even, it, hasn't, it doesn't even share a physical character of a super solid. But if those excitations can still be made, above, because we have such a weak optical lattice, we believe that the excitations could still be there, but gapped. And so we may still be able to I think to one important that. thing is in optical lattice anyway, that your density will have modulation because yeah. you have potential there. So right. the question is, you know, sort of more like at which wave vector, which whether that, you know, consistent with the underlying potential or it's, it's a spontaneous, yeah. spontaneous breaking, right? Like, yeah. yeah, I see the point you're making though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that Peter has a comment, um, not a question. Uh, is this fast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it helps to clarify that the spin orbit coupled system, even without the optical lattice, does exhibit the transition to a super solid or stripe like phase as a, as a well defined phase uh, transition but the parameters to get there are very stringent. So what the optical lattice does is just help us to get easier into this regime, which however the, super, the spin orbit coupled system on its own already exhibits. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So yeah, what Peter's getting at, there's a natural super solid with just spin orbit coupling, but the parameter regime under which you need to be to experimentally create that is, is impossible to achieve. We need magnetic stability that's way beyond that. Yeah. 